So I, I thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, I, I will challenge you all. It, there was, I used to do a lot of work um, in experiential education with everything from uh, about sixth grade up into college level. And one of the things we used to always talk about was challenge by choice. So I will tell you that I'll tell you any herbs that didn't come from my yard. Uh, there was a few I actually pulled out of the ground here around the, the center here. But uh, I will encourage you all to taste some of these and I will tell you when they taste like crap or not. So um, I'll try to save the best tasting things for the end to kind of cleanse your palate, if you will. Um, and it's an interesting thing, the, the American diet, we tend to really like sweet stuff. And most traditional cultures, they actually don't have that much sweet. That's really a treat. That's dessert, truly. Um, but what we find is most of the traditional cultures have a lot of spicy, they have a lot of bitter, sour, all these other plethora of fla flavors that really make food exciting. And when we look at medicine, we always hear that medicine tastes bad. It does. If it tastes really, really bad, it's really, really good medicine. And so when we look at traditional herbal medicine, oftentimes it really tastes like crap. Um, so most of what I talk about today, some of it will be food and medicine, but it will at the very least be medicine that we talk about. And when I, when I talk about these plants, there's, I always talk about there's different levels of medicine. And I started the way a lot of people, some of you um, may have studied a little bit of medicine, some of you read Reader's Digest and you saw, found out echinacea was good for everything. Um, it's not, by the way. Um, but what we call grandmother's medicine. And grandmother's medicine is this idea that most of you, if you have a cold, you can go down to CVS and you can find an antihistamine or some cold and flu formula and you take it and you drink it and you feel a little bit better and the cold runs its course. If you have some sinus from all the oak pollen, you know exactly what to get from CVS. Well, before there was CVS, you know, three or four weeks ago, um, People knew what plants, every mother, every grandmother knew, oh, I can just take this plant and that will f help my upset stomach. That will help my cold and flu. That will take care of my broken bone even. And then within every village, ultimately, there was somebody who knew a little bit more stuff. You know, our nurse practitioner, our doc in the box, a physician's assistant, that kind of person. Where if you had something a little bit more serious, it wasn't getting better, you go to that person. They would also help birth babies and things like that. And they would have herbs that they knew, they were a little bit more advanced. They would start to combine herbs together and start to make more complex medicine. But then ultimately there's really serious problems, right? We go to cardiologists and gastroenterologists and all these other fancy ologists. And ultimately that was the shaman. And the shaman in those traditional cultures, and this is across every continent and every traditional people. And that person worked on a spiritual, physical and emotional aspect. They worked on people by talking about diet and lifestyle and they changed the way people viewed things. That was that highest level of medicine. I can't say I'm that good. I, I, I aspire to the level of shaman. Another, another couple of lifetimes. And I, I had the opportunity about 15, 20 years ago, I was down in the Peruvian Amazon and I got to visit with a number of the shamans down there and watch them do some of their healings and stuff. And as we were going upstream, and we actually left uh, uh, Iquitos, which was one of the last major port towns, and we went upstream about a week. And as we went, went upstream, we saw the walls go away, and then we saw the windows leave, and to the point where it was just a thatched hut with a little privacy uh, fence this well, this high. And then what we noticed was that everybody had these perfect gardens. I mean, I would have eaten off their wood floors, or off their dirt floors. Every, every house had these beautiful little garden plots that were perfectly kept. And then in front of every house, there was this little window box full of weeds. And it literally just scraggly looking junk coming out of it. And I asked my guide, I was like, I see these beautiful kept things. How come every house has this yucky plot? He's like, that's the medicine cabinet. So all they had to do, just like we have a medicine cabinet in our bathroom that we go and pop our Tylenol or our Sudafed or whatever, they're reaching out and they're just eating a handful of these weeds and making a tea. It was from that experience that as I started to study uh, more formally my herbal medicine through Chinese medicine and so forth, that I was like, you know, all of this Chinese medicine stuff is awesome. Really it is, I, I'm fascinated by it. And, and it gives me this amazing ancient diagnostic system prior to Western medicine. The same type of idea that cultures around the world used. And they use some really simple concepts, hot, cold, wet, dry, deficient and excess. This is in every Native American culture, Central, South American, we can go to Asia, India, every one of those cultures work on this concept. 
And, and we all kind of experience that, but that's another lecture. Sorry, I, I like to go off on those tangents. So what I decided was, well, I love my Chinese medicine. I love my European herbal medicine, all those cool things we buy at the health food store. They're awesome, actually, and lots and lots of research. But I said, wait, there were people here long ago, and those people were traditional people that had food and medicine that they utilized, and we don't know anything about it. So how do I start to utilize that medicine that was here? How do I utilize that food that was here that we can access every day in our backyard in that unkept little flower box in front of our homes? And so it was challenging because ultimately we killed all those people, didn't we? Most of them, sadly, and their knowledge was lost. None of, I take that back, the, the Cherokee had a written language, but it wasn't created until about the 1700s. The native people here in the US, and in particular Florida, they had an oral tradition. And when you lose that race of people, you lose their tradition. But even back in the 16 and 1700s, we had anthropologists. They weren't great, but they were anthropologists nonetheless. And as they started to observe the native people, they would record what they saw. And so we can still find some of that stuff published and passed along. And even within the Seminole tribe, there's a little bit of information that, that comes out. But ultimately, that society is actually pretty smart. They keep us the heck out and, and keep their knowledge to themselves. I don't blame them at all. And then what I found out as I continued to explore these ideas was that some of the plants that we have here are also growing in Europe, are also growing up in the Southeast and even the Northeast. Some of them even come from China and India, that those same species or related species are here. So I found that as I started to branch out, I could bring that knowledge of, from around the world and bring that in to start to understand the plants that we have here just a little bit better. And I hate to say it through a lot of trial and error, um, I learned about some of the plants. Let me back up and tell you, even before I ended up uh, down in the Amazon and here, I actually grew up in the Bahamas, uh, one of the out islands, and, and I was an odd child. I actually dropped out of school, uh, worked on a commercial fishing boat, and the guy I worked, uh, I actually had half ownership in this commercial fishing boat at 14. I didn't know it, but he would be what we would call a shaman in this day and age. He actually, he played around with a little bit of magic stuff, and you know, there, there is voodoo within the islands. Um, but ultimately, he practiced herbal medicine. And we would sit up on the beach at night, crack and conk out, and that was mostly what we did, was conk and lobster. And he would teach me about some of these plants and the way people used them there in the islands. At 14, I can safely say, I didn't give a crap. I really didn't. I had no interest in what he taught. I listened, I was polite, I was a good kid. And ultimately, I just was exhausted and I wanted to go back to sleep on the boat and pray for a bath in the next two weeks. So, of course, now when I come here to Florida, a lot of those plants still grow here. The same ones that grow in the Bahamas grow here. And I, to this day, I walk around and go, man, I don't know what that is. And unfortunately, he's passed away since then. And um, they used common names and local names, not Latin names. So I have no frame of reference. And I will tell you before we even start handing any of these weird plants around, I am an herbalist, not a botanist. I stink at botany. You're a way better botanist than I am, I think. <laughs> and, and so what I do is there's those plants, and they're really the plants that I know well, they're, where there aren't a lot of lookalikes. Those are the ones I utilize for myself, I utilize for my patients, and I brought to share with you today. And like I said, a lot of it's trial and error. I've actually been eating wild edible plants and occasionally medicinal plants literally since I was a little kid. I started exploring uh, edible plants um, when I was about 10 years old in a, a camp up in Maine, the camp nurse took us around for a hike. And I, I actually, before I moved to the Bahamas, I was in New York City. Real shift of paradigm there, let me tell you. And so we go around the camp in Maine, and they're like, there's a strawberry, wild, and a blueberry that I could pick and eat. And then it was, eat this flower, eat this leaf. And she was nice, she only made us taste good things. And so I took that back and, you know, who's it, Wild Bill Brill or whatever he is, eaten in Central Park. I was doing that at 12, and then I moved down to the Bahamas. And I progressed through that. And then I, I went to school here in St. Pete, um, actually about the 11th grade, 10th grade, I moved here. Um, at some point after dropping out of school, mom decided that I really should go to school. Um, and I, I, you know, Facebook is great. I, I found my old roommate. I was actually at uh, Admiral Farragut back in the day when they didn't have air conditioning. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and, and Enrique Zenaletti was my roommate then, and the second thing he said on Facebook was, oh, I so remember your first week in school, you pre puking your guts out because I ate the wrong plant. I was still learning at that point. And one of the things I didn't understand yet, and lesson one for the evening, 
know where you get your plant and always be perfectly sure of the plant that you harvest. So I was harvesting it from the baseball field. They used a lot of pesticides back in the day. And so I don't know what kind of crap, and honestly, I was an even worse botanist back then than I am now. So it's always important that we are very careful where we harvest our plants from. And there's a really good herbalist rule of thumb. Always harvest your plants higher than a dog's leg. Don't ever forget that. <laughs> Although pee is sterile, I prefer it not to be on my medicine. Although in some countries that is medicine. Well, let's start with something very familiar. I know nobody knows what this plant is. It's a lovely plant. And I would say that we need to eat more flowers. Um, flowers, generally the ones that are edible, are actually quite tasty. And this, hopefully you all know, is a hibiscus. Um, this is a medicinal plant used throughout the tropics and, and uh, even the semi-tropical regions. And it's an interesting, I say I'm not a, a, a botanist, but this is in the mallow fam family, Malviaceae. And you all know uh, a more common mallow, and that's okra, right? Slimalicious. It's the most slimy, yummy, especially when it's deep fried. That's bad for you, don't do that. Um, well, as it turns out, all the mallows, except for one that I know of, uh, cotton is a mallow, uh, and that's not uh, edible. Um, but all the mallows, or most of the mallows are edible. And even though, really crunchy, right? The reality is, if you eat the leaves of this, it's almost as slimy as okra. And so in Chinese medicine, remember I said hot, cold, wet, dry, deficient excess? Slimy. So guess what? This is a wet plant. It's really good for people who feel very dry. And ultimately we say it's cooling. So guess what? This is great for constipation. It happens to be very good for a restless sleeper. So not the person who can't get to sleep, but actually the person who wakes up very easily. It's actually somewhat helpful for menopause, night sweats and hot flashes, and ultimately it's just really yummy. The nice thing about hibiscus is it's actually very specific for the heart and the circulatory system. It's used throughout the Caribbean, it's used in Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. I think I got a critter on me, yeah. Um, the flowers taste really good. The leaves are kind of a cross between sweet, bitter, with a touch of sour. Um, I would say if you want the, the easy entry, please eat the leaves, or the flower. Um, flowers as a whole, the entire thing tends to be sweeter and not quite as slimy. The, the leaves are considered more medicinal and the most medis medicinal part is actually the stem. It's very specific um, for um, heart failure, uh, really weak, slow heartbeat, brachycardia, things like that. Um, and it is food. This is something that we can add into our salads and it's quite tasty. I will pass that around and let you guys enjoy that. And this did come from my yard, so it's picked it from higher than a dog's leg, and um, it has no pesticides on it, so I feel pretty safe with that one. And you know, it's unfortunate. I have enough plants here to talk for about four hours, and I know I only got 45 minutes, so I'm gonna try to pull the really interesting ones on uh, out of here that I know people have more access to. You know, and, and this brings us to the idea that, and I was talking to Ray earlier, it was like, you know, some of the folks are gonna be here, this is their, their first excursion into growing in Florida, and it's always fascinating. You, we get so many people who up north, they had a green thumb. They get down here, everything dies. And part of it's our crappy soil, you know, we, we, we attest to that. And the fact that we have the complete opposite growing season of what you understand. And then we do things, and I love the Green Thumb Festival. I'll have a table there. Um, but ultimately, we're selling all of these garden plants at the end of April when our growing season's done. <laughs> and so a lot of people were like, what, this is, the, you sold it to me, and now why is it dead? Because up north, this worked. One of the reasons I like to talk about the native plants, besides the way coolness factor of it, is the fact that, promise, these have adapted here. You can't fail at this. Actually, you're probably going nuts trying to get rid of this plant because it has completely taken over your yard, it's all over your pant legs, and your dog won't even eat it. Uh, this is Spanish needles, uh, Biden's Alba, and this is probably one of the most useful plants in your yard. It is a wonderful food. 
It has been considered uh, as a uh, crop, a uh, food crop, and for whatever reason, they decided it was too easy. Oops, you don't put, yeah, yeah, you do belong in there. Um, and it's actually absolutely amazing medicine. This is actually a Chinese herb. In China, Xian Feng Sao is the name of this plant. Um, they actually make a tea out of the leaves in southern China that they use to cool off with in the summer. So guess what its energetic property is? This is a cooling plant. When I started to do research on this plant uh, from a Chinese perspective, it turns out they've done research on it for malaria, leukemia, and HIV. So it has some very powerful antiviral properties to it. But then I went, remember I mentioned those anthropologists from a couple hundred years ago who weren't absolutely amazing? Well, I found a reference that he was visiting one of the Florida native people and they used it for cough. That's all they said. There's only one type of cough, right? No, of course not. There's a million types of cough. There's green and yellow and clear and white and there's strong coughs and weak coughs and acute coughs and chronic coughs. Which one is it for? And I had no idea because guess what? The Chinese don't use it for cough. It has nothing to do with cough. So, you know, the, the teach-in when, when adults go out to the elementary schools and the schools and we go out there and we brag about how cool our job is, somebody was dumb enough to ask me to come to a bunch of third graders. And I kind of did what I did doing to you all, and that is I went out to the school grounds, I pulled up a bunch of weeds, and I was like, hey, check out all this cool food that's growing on your property. And it's probably sprayed with all kinds of creepy stuff. But I pass around, third graders are adventuresome in some things, but not in bitter plants. So as I pass them around the same way I do to you guys, I was like, oh, you know, eat it if you want. If you, know, you don't like it, I don't take offense if you spit it out and make funny faces. That's really normal. Well, third graders do that to me anyway. But there was this one kid in the class, and <laughs> whole time in there, he's coughing up a storm, coughing up a storm, really kind of distracting, and the teacher's apologizing, the kid's apologizing, really great kids, and he was the only one who ate the leaves of this. And so you get 15 minutes to talk about how cool you are, and then you go on to the next class. And so I'm walking down the hallway, and all of a sudden, Bob, 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 what'd you give to little Johnny? And I'm like, oh my God, you know, is my malpractice insurance, anaphylactic shock, you know, anybody can have an allergy? And they're like, Johnny, stop coughing. I'm like, Ooh, I have no idea why. And literally, um, like three weeks later, I get a letter written in third grader from little Johnny going, thank you so much for curing my cough. And this kid had for weeks been coughing and he'd been on steroids and on an inhaler and all of this stuff. And you know, sometimes if we just pay attention, we figure out what things are for. So what it turns out, and I've experimented way too many times on people, you know, you catch a cold and flu and you get a cough and it goes down into your lungs, but then your cold and flu is gone and you're left with this residual kind of irritating cough, clear white phlegm. It's no longer infective. You don't need to get anything special. It's just irritating at this point. And it can go on for months, literally. One day of these, a couple of tablespoons, one to three times in the day, and your cough goes away. Not just for a few minutes, it's gone primary use of this plant, the leaves, is to stop a cough with clear white phlegm residual after a cold and flu. And it works like magic. I've used this on kids as young as two years old. Okay, I made it as a tea for them. Adults, just eat the leaves. It's actually quite tasty. I will also tell you that this is more nutritious than spinach. It has a huge uh, nutritional profile. It's great in scrambled eggs. When we run out of spinach at the house or any other greens, I just, we go out in the yard and we pull up a bunch of this. And so, a, as a dirty herbalist, and, I, and I'll say also the flowers, uh, oh, I just like this stuff. The flowers actually taste better, but there may not be enough flowers to go around. Yeah, you always get to have it first, no fair. You know what that tastes like. Um, that this plant, um, I always thought it was bitter. And I always described it to people. It's like, oh, it's a little bitter, but it's not too bad. You know, when you plant lettuce and we pick it when it's small, right? And then at some point, right around this time of year, it starts to go to seed. It, it, it starts to shoot up and then we go, oh, it's no good anymore because it turns bitter. I'm not a good botanist. So guess how I identify the Spanish needles? I look for the flower, very easy to identify. Well, my plant has already gone to flower, it's gone to seed at the time when we wouldn't use it for food. So not too long ago, actually a couple of months ago, we, we had just weeded out an old garden patch of ours. 
And of course, we didn't do anything, so lots of little baby Bidens came up. And so I was like, oh, you know, I know that's Biden. So I started to eat it. It is so good. It tastes like lettuce. It's sweeter than spinach. And so if we get it before it goes to seed, it is actually a wonderful, nutritious weed that I promise you, if you have this much dirt in your yard, you have Spanish needles. So food, medicine, tea, and here's an even better one. When we're all out there and we're working in the garden and you get little bug bites and you get little scratches, take the flowers or the leaves and we do what's called the spit poultice. Well, you can chew it up, but I usually just mash it up with my fingers, put it on there. It's uh, antimicrobial and it helps to take some of the heat out. Remember, it's cooling. So the redness that comes up, it helps to remove some of that redness and causes some soothing and lets the swelling go down quite simply. So absolutely amazing plant. Hmm. All right, we're going to go for, a, oh no, that's too soon to go for a yummy one. We're going to save him for last. Um, I'm not going to pass this one around um, because half this plant is poisonous and half of it's amazing medicine. This is a Florida native. Um, this is elderberry or elder. Um, generally, it's considered that the stem, the leaves, the roots are actually mildly toxic, but the flowers and the berries are uber yummy. Um, I actually know of one family up north, because this grows all over the place. They actually will pick the, uh, the flower heads, and this one's just about to flower, and they batter it and they deep fry it, and they serve it like uh, deep fried uh, cauliflower. I can't say I've tried that yet, but it looked really good in the pictures. There's an idea in herbal medicine, and this is, again, this is a cross-cultural. The Chinese have one way of looking at it. The, the Native Americans, the eclectics, all the different herbalists look at, um, when we get to cold and flu and we start to get a fever, we've all heard the term, it's like, oh, the fever broke, I'm gonna feel better now, right? So we use herbs that actually make us break a sweat. And diaphoresis is the fancy name for it, release exterior if you're into Chinese medicine. And we tend to use the aerial parts of the plant. So this is the upper part of a plant. And we like to use flowers, leaves, things like that that grow near the surface of the plant. Elder flowers, happen to be a premier release exterior or diaphoretic herb. So making a tea out of the flowers will help you break a sweat. One of my favorite combinations is yarrow flowers. Okay, yarrow's not native, but it's really easy to grow and the white flowers of that in combination with the elder and chamomile, which chamomile doesn't grow that great, but you can get it anywhere. Um, that in equal amounts, make a strong tea, steep it for five to 10 minutes. The stronger, the better and basically sip on it until you get a hot flash. Chances are you wake up in the morning, you won't be sick. And you'll get a great night's sleep from the chamomile. Um, by itself, this works. There is volumes of research in the US and in uh, Europe to include the German E-Commission that recognizes syrup uh, or alcohol extractions of the berries of elderberry for upper respiratory infections to specifically for children, but works just as well for adults. So any kind of re upper respiratory infection, berries and flowers, absolutely amazing. Excuse me. Yes. Did you say the stem was poisonous? Yeah, generally you only use this part right here. Flowers. Yeah, and I mean, people will leave this little bit of stem in there, it's fine, so but, you can make tea with it, but not just tea. this part, okay. just this part. Thank you. And you have to beat the birds to the berries. And if you have it, you know, and you can make wine. I'm not sure the medicinal properties of that. Um, and Ray, can you give me like a 10 minute, oh, I see a clock. Just kind of give me a thumbs up when I need to shut up because uh, we'll leave it open. Um, and I'm not going to pass this one around. Actually, I'll pass this around, but I'll tell you not to eat it because I did pull it um, right out the front door next to the hibiscus. I got this right in front of the, uh, the center here. Anybody um, take flaxseed? You know, put the flaxseed in your smoothies. This has, you take it for the essential fatty acids, right? Well, this has more essential fatty acids in it than your flaxseed, and it's a weed in your yard, grows in full sun, total sand and you're pulling it out as a weed. This is purslane. This is the same purslane that they sell at Home Depot. Don't buy your plants there. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a Florida native. There's a couple of different varietals. They have, actually have very pretty flowers. The entire plant is edible, but the tastiest part is the uh, petals. And they're also mucilaginous, translated to slimy. Um, but full of minerals, potassium, magnesium, a little bit of calcium. Uh, iodine, uh, so it's good for your thyroid, and full of essential fatty acids, more than flax. And you can grow it, throw it in your smoothies. This is considered cooling, 
It's very effective internally and externally. Rosacea or any kind of dry, redness uh, on the face, and that can be sunburn to rosacea to uh, dry scaly acne. Making a face mask of this, absolutely amazing. Um, it will pull that redness out, start to heal the skin, nourish the skin. You can uh, combine it with anything from uh, a little bit of aloe juice to whatever you usually put in your face mask. But this is a wonderful, wonderful agent for that. Um, it's closed up a little bit, but I, I will, don't eat this one, you won't die from it, but uh, it did come from lower than dog's leg and um, out in front here, I don't know if they spray. Yes, sir. As far as I know, all of the uh, purslanes are edible. Um, although there's one sea purslane, which isn't truly a purslane, but it's also edible. <laughs> and it looks like purslane grows down by the water. Sea purslane is, is one that looks like purslane, but isn't a true purslane, um, but it's also edible. And, it's also edible. Yeah, and really yummy. Actually, it's salty and crunchy. It's thicker um, and oh so tasty. Um, I'll actually just eat those raw all day long. Anybody here from the Caribbean islands, uh, Jamaica? All right, you know Surasi, right? All right, I knew he did. <laughs> Everybody from the islands knows Surasi, right? So this is bitter melon, um, balsam apple, a couple of different names for it. You've all seen this growing on fences and hedges and things like that. It has that little orange spiky uh, fruit on it. It opens up, there's red seeds inside. And depending on who you ask, they'll either say, oh, you'll die if you eat that or you know, any number of other things. If you read about bitter melon, you're going to see this long, green, warty thing, and they're going to talk about Chinese medicine. And the problem is there's two varietals of bitter melon. There's a Chinese varietal, which doesn't grow here. You could probably grow it. Uh, I haven't seen it. And you can go to the Asian markets and you can find this thing. We eat the fruit of that. The other type is this one. This is a Caribbean bitter melon. In this one, we eat the leaves. We don't eat the fruit. And in Jamaica, if you grew up there as a kid, they were like, oh, it cleanses the blood or cools the blood, right? So you'd eat a couple leaves every day and it keeps your blood clean or cool or however we'd like to say that. And I, I, I know I talked to somebody once uh, and they were like, I hated my mom. She made me eat this stuff every day and it tastes absolutely horrid. I did get this here, so you shouldn't eat this, but I actually like bitter melon. It's horribly bitter. Um, but once you start to like bitter, then you actually start to like this thing. So as it turns out, the research shows that bitter melon, whether you use the fruit or the leaf, is absolutely phenomenal for lowering blood sugar. It helps uh, with insulin resistance. It uh, allows for what insulin uh, that your pancreas is producing to work more effectively. It also aids with digestion. Um, and it's interesting, people who have elevated blood sugars oftentimes feel very hot. They drink a lot of fluids. This old wives' tale of it cooling the blood is actually pretty darn accurate. It reduces the inflammation of the cell and improves cellular respiration and metabolism. So these old wives' tales sometimes are pretty accurate. We just now proved what everybody in Jamaica knew for the last however many hundreds of years. Uh, <laughs> I would say don't eat the orange fruit. Opinions vary. I will tell you, you'll most likely end up with explosive diarrhea. If that's a good time for you, enjoy the hell out of it. <laughs> I'll pass this around so you can get a good look at it. Um, can you eat the fruit before it turns orange? Um, my understanding is no. But what I, I have done personally, those cool little red seeds on the inside, the pulp on that, not the seed itself, but the pulp around it, is actually one of the highest sources of lycopene. Some of you may have heard about lycopene, cook your tomato sauce and it increases the lycopene, it's good for guys and their prostate. And it's so weird, here's this most bitter leaf that we have here, and yet the fruit, the pulp of the seed is sweet. You can suck the pulp off, spit out the seeds. Cramping, explosive diarrhea, that thing, you know, if, if you don't. I, I know people who say they eat it, I'm not going near it. <laughs> Do whatever you like on that one. I, I actually, I've heard anything from poison to just uh, irritant, and it causes the cramping and so forth, that there's like a latex of some sorts in there. Yep. You know, for, for a lot of these, I would consider like the Spanish needles, it's food. Um, things like the bitter melon, I would actually limit your dosage. Um, 
you know, classically, I, I don't know what you heard in Jamaica, but I always heard three to five leaves. That was it. Anything more than that, you probably get sick and so bitter. Am I close on that? Pretty close? All right. So um, generally with the bitter melon, um, and I've actually given this to patients. I had a woman, she was from uh, Cuba, an old Cuban woman, and she would do nothing to control her diabetes. Ate every bit of sugar, no feeling in her feet. And she was coming in, I was doing acupuncture, doing all this other stuff, and honestly not much was working because she would do nothing to control her blood sugar. She was injecting higher and higher doses of insulin, and ultimately I was like, well, this isn't working. So I needed to come up with plan B. So I was like, I asked her, and this woman was probably in her mid eighties. And she had just emigrated to the US like maybe 20 years ago. So she, she was old school. And I was like, did they have bush medicine? And that's what a lot of people called that grandmother's medicine was bush medicine. I was like, did you have people who practice bush medicine? She's like, oh, my mama did. And she knew a little bit. And so what I did, it was like, I got a picture of it because I couldn't find any. And I, her daughter would bring her in. I was like, do you have this growing in your yard? And it was that time of year where it was everywhere. And she's like, yeah. I was like, show this to your mom. And she was translating for us because she didn't speak any English. And she was like, oh yeah, I know that. And I was like, you have to eat three leaves two to three times a day. And she did. And you know what? Her feeling came back in her feet. Her blood sugar levels came back to normal. So very, very small amount of fresh leaf is very effective. And I'm going to put a caution on herb drug interactions. If you're injecting insulin, or even if you're on insulin uh, regulating uh, uh, pills, if you lower your blood sugar levels with some crazy weed that grows in your yard, now you have low blood sugar if you don't regulate your insulin dosages and so forth. Now you get dizzy from a low blood sugar, fall over, break a hip, that would be bad. So it's important when we do herbs and drugs together that we regulate them and make sure that we monitor things like blood pressure and blood sugar and so forth. Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it actually do enough of it that it starts to move the poop, even the leaves, uh, with, with gusto sometimes. Yeah, very, very common. I mean, I know people just drying it and eating it. Yeah, yeah, and it grows wild, and, and it, you don't even have to like plant it. It's there. You just have to learn to start to recognize it. Um, and I will say that the Chinese varietal works as good as the Caribbean varietal. But you've got to go to the store to buy the Chinese varietal. This one's already here for us. So this is common right here in the forest. It, it, yes, it's a weed that grows on every fence. Huh? You can purchase this in some stores, the dried. Oh, really? The dried stuff, yeah. Most of the stuff, though, that you get in a pill at the health food store is the Chinese stuff, not the Caribbean. But yeah, this is a common weed. It, it is growing on your hedge. Uh, it's growing on fence lines. And it's just starting to come up right now. Uh, another few months, you'll see the yellow, f yellow flowers that come off from it, and then the orange, fruit, green, and then yellow fruit, and it'll start to open up. Once you see it, there's no questions about it. Yes, ma'am. How do you spell this? Uh, the bitter melon. Bitter melon? Yes. Yeah, just like bitter fruit. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, no, nothing. Uh, and I won't pretend to remember the Latin on it. Somebody here will tell you. <laughs> but if you Google bitter, bitter melon, uh, it'll come up on a, any kind of a Google search very easily with really clear pictures of it. It's all over the place. Um, what shall I pull out now? Oh, we're going to have some fun with one of these. Um, no, we're going to save you for last because you taste the best. Wow. So all of you have been ripping this off your fences and out of your hedges. Um, this is Kumalina. It has tiny little blue flowers on it. Comalina is the Latin name, and there's a number of different species. Turns out this is a Chinese herb, Comalina. I spell horribly. Uh, C-O-M-I-N, uh, or no, I-L-I-N-A, I believe. Comalina. I'm close. Um, and by the way, if any of these you're like, what was that stupid thing with a C? I'll spell it for you because I'll look it up. <laughs> um, I, I do answer emails fairly well. Um, Turns out this is a Chinese herb as well. And this is a yin tonic, which means it, it nourishes the cooling, nourishing fluids of the body. This one is used for people, we say, have a dry stomach. So they're kind of hungry all the time, but no desire to eat. 
So you're just kind of like, I don't know what I want, but you got this gnawing, burning in your stomach. It also helps with excessive stomach acid. Um, so acid reflux, this can be very helpful. And although it would be my last choice for night sweats, hot flashes, and any kind of skin dryness, if you had nothing else, it wouldn't be so bad. And also, it's a very mild flavor, uh, and so it can be added to salads. This is also what we'd call a pot herb. We can stir fry it, think cooked spinach, uh, and quite tasty. And promise, this is growing all over your hedges. Stems too? Yeah, the stems. Uh, I like the leaves. The flowers are actually sweet. I think Japanese dayflower might, is that the spiderwort or is, it might be Jap, it might be the dayflower, but their spiderwort looks also a small blue flower, but slightly larger and it's almost a grass. Yeah. And, and I, all yeah, and, the, and the, this, that's the nice thing. The only thing that might be misunderstood for it is also edible. <laughs> and, and dayflower, there's a lot of different kinds. Some are actually toxic. So if you just search dayflower without the good botany to go with it, so you can get. Yes. And I just had a brain cramp on the name of this one. All right, help me out. Why can't I think of the name of this one? June, what's the name of that one? <laughs> we, you pottered a whole bunch up. And I just had a brain cramp. Uh, it's not oh, that's Pellatory, thank you. God, oh, jeez. You know, there's too many plants in my head, and I do forget the names periodically. Too much stuff in my head. This is Pellatory. If you grew up in Southern Europe, I'm going to make a mess of this joint. You knew it as Pellatory of the Wall. This is a related species. This one's a little bitter. Usually it tastes like cucumber. Oh, there comes the cucumber flavor. Um, I like this mostly to snack on. The smaller ones are sweeter and too many plants I'm eating. Taste like cucumbers. And um, these are a little large. These were actually huge. These were like knee high when I picked them. Um, we use this as a mild diuretic, as a lymphatic, which means it moves the lymph. So if you have swelling of the ankles, um, swelling of the fingers, hands. But mostly I like to snack on it. Um, I read something recently on it as well that I had not remembered uh, using it for, and um, that was for kidney stones and gallstones, but primarily kidney stones, that as a daily tonic, it helps to prevent them, and should you get uh, kidney stones, oftentimes it's combined with other things, in particular mallows. So although hibiscus isn't uh, normally used for it, it would work in a pinch because of its slippery or slimy nature to it. But there is actually some decent research showing the pellitory as helping to dissolve stones. Um, so it's not something that's going to strongly move them out. So if you've actually been told you either have a tendency towards the development of kidney stones, or uh, you know you got one and you're just waiting for that day when it decides to travel on down, start eating that now. The pellitory is, um, it tends to grow on the edge of things, along the walls. Uh, so you'll always see it along the hedge line, you'll, along the edge of paths, along the curb line on the street, and literally it is everywhere. Uh, there's more of this even than the, than the Spanish needles, um, and quite yummy if you ask me. It seems to grow just at this time of the year, doesn't it? It actually grows year-round, um, but it's really prevalent right now. It's out of control, but I can find that any time of the year if you look around a little bit. Um, a lot of folks confuse that with chickweed. Uh, chickweed does grow down here, but only in the winter time. It's, I won't say it's rare, but it's less common. Um, and once it starts to get warm in the first summer rains, you will not find any chickweed. Uh, this one, uh, though, slows down as, as the summer kicks into full gear, but you'll still find it on, in the shadier spots. Yeah, I'm getting there, aren't I? Um, I'm going to do three more, and then I'll shut up. Oh. Okay, I gotta do that one too. Actually, this one's more important. That one's just interesting for me. Um, this one, everybody should know. This is, an, oops, this is an amazing medicine. This is plantain. Not the plantain as in a banana, but plantain as in plantago, and there's a couple of, I'll just say, species. Uh, there's a couple of different plantain species. Every plantain 
has a medicinal and or edible function. It's very easy to identify with this unique uh, seed stalk that comes off of it. Um, right now, they're everywhere. There's two primary uh, varietals that grow here in Florida. One is with these uh, very narrow leaves, which is kind of unique to this area. Um, the other one is the broadleaf plantain. And so if you lived up north, you saw these everywhere. It was a really uh, larger leaf, very distinct veined uh, uh, leaves uh, going parallel to the, to the uh, stalk. Um, you can eat the leaves. Uh, it's a pot herb. Depending on where you harvest it, some taste really good, some taste horrendous. Um, so you kind of have to learn your patch. But more importantly, this is one of the finest wound healing herbs that I know of. And there, there are two big wound healing herbs in herbal medicine, uh, and it's a couple of supporting characters. Comfrey is one. Comfrey is not native here, but you can grow it. And I think everybody who has a garden ought to grow some comfrey. Um, the problem with comfrey is it's so effective at growing the skin that it will grow skin over the top of a wound and track the bacteria in there and creating a worse infection than you had in the first place. The plantain will actually start to heal the flesh from the inside out. And it is very specific uh, for non-healing wounds, everything from diabetic ulcers to creepier things. Um, it's mildly antimicrobial, um, so you can combine it with things that are antimicrobial, other herbs, or even things like triple anti-B or some other kind of uh, antibiotic cream. And I, I'll tell you two stories about this. Um, very early in my, my herb slash acupuncture career, I, um, and I'll pass these guys around. Um, we had a, a gentleman come in and he'd been in a wheelchair as a uh, paraplegic for over 20 years from a car accident. And he had a number of issues that we, we were successful with, but one of the things that, that oftentimes happens when, when you're immobilized um, is that you end up with a pressure sores. And so he had a number of, I think he had like five or six non-healing ulcerations on his leg. And party, pardon for the grossness of all that. Hopefully um, you guys have already had dinner. Um, but nothing worked. He was on the most powerful antibiotics where the nurses weren't allowed to even administer it if they were pregnant. Um, and they were stopping working. So the infections were getting worse. The ulcers were enlarging. And uh, the other acupuncturist who was working with me was actually uh, his doctor. And she goes, Bob, you've got to have some kind of a trick up your sleeve. This isn't working. And she showed me the wounds. And I was like, I had just seen this growing in my yard. And I was like, I know just the thing. And so I, I told the guy to come back the next day. And I went into my yard and I pulled a whole bunch of them up, rinsed the dirt off. And I handed him this paper towel full of about a half a dozen plantains. And I said, go home, make a tea out of that. And I want you to put it on your wound. And so he actually got smart. He put it in a spray bottle. He actually made a really nice, strong concentration. And he started spraying his legs with it. Within three weeks, the wound started to heal for the first time ever. Within two months, all but two of his ulcerations were completely healed over and looked normal. Absolutely ridiculous. And for years, he had combated, combated this in the Western medical realm. We had another patient about four or five years ago, um, actually had a non-healing wound on her butt. Um, it was about this deep, and it was getting deeper. She was going every, I think it was every two weeks, to a wound care center where they, you know, they put ooky... Um, uh, antibiotic cream packed cotton in there and they take it out and they put new stuff in. It's really disgusting. And, and I mean, literally, if you wanted to, you could put a finger in there. And it was getting worse and worse. Two years, this had continued to get worse. Western medicine had absolutely nothing other than to continue the same process that was getting worse and worse. And so she was seeing us for a number of other issues and she was like, can there anything you can do for this? And again, it was another acupuncturist and, and she said, Bob, what do you got? And uh, we put plantain, actually, and uh, astragalus, and frankincense, and myrrh. Yeah, that's right. At least two of the three wise men were herbalists, who were oftentimes considered the wise people, because uh, they were healers, as well as spiritual leaders. And we actually put it in a coffee grinder. We ground it up. They were dried. We put it in a plastic bag and said, we're not going near that wound here. For whatever reason, this wound care center actually packed the wound with our herbs. And they continued to do that for a couple of weeks. It healed. Plantain is an absolutely amazing, amazing plant that can be used externally or eaten. And so when we're looking at non-healing ulcers, those can be in your stomach, those can be in your bowels, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, 
all of those things can benefit from the eating and or drinking of plantain. And it's a weed in your yard. Yes? I would actually use the leaves. They're actually considered the strongest part, but the whole plant can be used. Uh, the leaves are the, the rockinest part of it all. Um, I want to look at two more, and then we'll open it up to any questions that anybody has. Um, this is truly one of my favorite ones to snack on, um, and these did come from my yard. Uh, it has a couple of different inc incarnations. But a lot of you will recognize these little paddle-shaped seeds that are on the uh, pepper grass, Lepidium virginicus. Believe it or not, yes, this is a Chinese herb as well. It happens to grow throughout the eastern seaboard. This is a type of wild mustard. It is so yummy, it's ridiculous. Um, my favorite thing to do, and I don't, I don't want to mess it up, is I'll actually, um, if I got soup or something, I'll go along these seeds and I'll just and strip the seeds off and throw them in a soup. Um, the leaves are all edible, and what I find is I, I do like spicy. If you don't like spicy at all, please don't eat this. You, you won't like it. But if you're like, oh, I'm okay with a little spicy, like a little ginger is okay, what I find is you eat it and you're like, no, oh, I'm not that spicy, and you'll get a little bite of sweet, and then the spice will come up, and right when you're like, I don't know if I should have eaten this, it'll stop. So it won't get too bad, so don't panic. Um, and if you go running out of here, I'll understand. Um, yeah, I'll give you the one with the seeds. So this one has the seeds on it and a couple of little flowers, and this one is what it looks like without the seeds or the flowers on it. Um, what I find is every plant is a little bit different, um, but all of them are absolutely wonderful. My first choice with this is food. Honestly, I just love it. It's this sweet, spicy mustard that belongs in every salad, every soup, every stir fry, you name it. But ultimately, we hear about every, you know, your grandmothers or whatever, they'd put a mustard pack on when you had a cough. And it would warm things up and break up the congestion. Well, that's just crazy talk. And yet, every traditional culture uses a mustard in that fashion. Well, when I looked it up as a Chinese herb, and admittedly it's a little obscure, they actually take it internally for a cough. And so it helps to break up the congestion that that spiciness, that aromatic, that little bit of irritant actually causes the mucosal lining of your lung to excrete more fluids, and it becomes an expectorant. It's very simple. Um, it can also, if you eat large amounts of it, it can help to move the bowels. In the same way, it acts as an irritant to the mucous membrane of the intestines, secretes a little extra moisture, the poop moves fairly gently, not like the bitter melon where it does it with gusto. Um, and I'm going to save this, la this last one is truly one of my favorites. And I usually just get a stick and I start digging around in the ground looking for this one. Um, but today I was like, ooh, I'm going to be talking to a whole new crowd of people. And you know, actually, this is a great crowd. And I really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. So I got hardcore. I went and got a shovel. I never use the shovel to find this. This is something called rattlesnake root. It's also, uh, its proper name is um, Stachys floridata whatever, Florida Betany, a couple of different names. But this is actually, oddly enough, it's related to mint. It has a square stem, it has a leaf uh, that's a classic mint, except it has no smell. The part that we want, though, I don't know whether you, I'll pass this around. This is actually one of the longest, biggest ones I've seen in a really long time. Normally, this is what I'm picking. So pulling out the shovel, score. I don't plant this, this is in my yard. This is a weed that came with the house and it's in every one of your yards as well. When I go through Boyd Hill and I go hiking around, there's literally the paths on either side are lined with this plant. And you just pass it up, you run your lawnmower and your weed whapper over it. And underneath is this treasure. And I will tell you, um, according to Green Dean, I don't know if any of you have ever looked at uh, Green Dean's website, eattheweeds.com. I've been on a few walks with him he says that up north you can sell this for around 100, 150 bucks a pound. Nobody better steal this. <laughs> and I don't know about that. I haven't tried to sell one of these, but I will tell you this is like the sweetest radish you ever had. Not spicy, but that texture, that crispy crunch of a radish, but sweet and a mild sweet, um, almost carrot-like, but sweeter than that. And you can literally go digging around in your dirt and knock these out. It's very easy to identify when, you, when it comes around, notice the square stem, notice this very distinct ridge shape to the leaf. There's no smell to the leaf 
and ultimately, there's little runners that attach, uh, attaches to it are white. So if you find this plant, let it get down in there and start knocking the dirt away, and you're gonna find this little white line. And I literally followed this for about two feet. And you're gonna follow the white line, white line, and then dig down a little bit dirt, deeper as it starts to go down. And if you're lucky, you'll find a prize at the end. And this is a prize, let me just tell you. And I think I got two, ooh, oh, 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 ah. All of that, and I get this one little tuber. <laughs> and then this guy, oh, no, there's two there. Uh, see, you got short change. You can have the other shorty. <laughs> and then this little guy has that big bohunkin tuber on there. Isn't that amazing? Um, uh, that, it's Florida betony is the common name for it. Stachys floridata, or rattlesnake root, is the old Florida cracker way of talking about it. Mostly, it's just so yummy. But that said, it is medicine. And this is a little bit of a stretch because this doesn't grow anywhere else. The, the European betony has completely different use. And even though they're related, the, the tuber on this is special. And I've really played with it. And I, I, I hate to say, I, I, I'm very medical, right? I'm, I, I was a biochem major for a little while and I decided that was dumb. But, I spend most of my time with my head stuck in medical journals and looking at Western medicine as much as I do Chinese medicine and herbal medicine. But in the same sense, I like to talk with plants. And I know that's a little crazy talk. And so sometimes we sit there and we spend some time nibbling on a plant and we, seen, we see how it makes us feel. Um, we try to experience the plant. And one, one of my mentors, uh, David Winston, he's a, a Cherokee uh, medicine man, herbalist, Chinese, he's probably one of the best herbalists in the country as far as I'm concerned. And he talks about, you know, in, in native culture, we have conversations with plants and animals. And he always tells the story of, of one day, and it was when the, the stinging nettles and the big field of it in the back of his property, and he had an outhouse at the time. And he was having some prostate problems, I think it was, and he's running back and forth to the outhouse, back and forth, back and forth. And it was this really calm, calm day, there's no wind, and about the second or third time he runs back and forth, there's a rattling and there's these little seed pods on the, on the stinging nettles when, they, when they're going to seed. And every time he'd run by, he'd hear this rattle of the seeds and he'd just run back to the house, run back to the outhouse. And he stopped at some point and he was like, what's all this rattling I keep hearing? And when he stopped and he kind of focused without focusing and decided to look over and, and, and see the plant and the plant said, eat me take my seeds. And ultimately, he is uh, credited with discovering not that the leaves of the stinging nettle, but actually the seeds of the stinging nettle were specific for kidney function and the prostate. And to this day, now all the other herbalists uh, in, in the country actually utilize those nettle seeds because the plant told him. And I won't say that this plant told me, but as I played with it and I tried to feel what I experienced with this plant, I found it was a tonic. And there's a root kind of like that that we all might know. It's called ginseng. And there's an American ginseng that if you go up north, North Georgia and the Carolinas and on all the way up into, into southern Canada, we find American ginseng. But we don't find it here. Where is our tonic? And I found that this is our tonic. It's subtle. It's very subtle. It's not that, yeah, I had some ginseng. Um, but what I find is we have this idea of adaptogens. And adaptogens are those things that help us handle stress better, they nourish the body, um, and they make everything work a little bit better. And they ground us. And oftentimes our root vegetables like that ground us. This is a root vegetable, it's a tuber. But I find that ultimately it very subtly seems to work as an adaptogen in this tonic-like fashion. So I would encourage people to eat it as a food, but also know that it has a benefit to include the leaves that you can make a tea out of. It doesn't taste good or bad, it's kind of tasteless, honestly. Um, but it will nourish and help you adapt to the stressors of your environment. And, and I want to kind of wrap this up because we touched on a lot of different ideas. I've passed around herbs from around the world that all grow here, wild. Some of them have adapted over literally thousands of years, some over hundreds of years, some have been here since the beginning of time. 
And as we start to explore this idea of gardening, of food, of medicine, you're here trying to learn about sustainable agriculture. How do we put plants in the ground to nourish ourselves, provide food, so that we don't go to the grocery store to buy every single thing, that we're not stuck purchasing GMO uh, altered foods or things sprayed with pesticides. And as we clear our land to plant our seeds, as we try to compost and we do all the things to amend our soil, we pull out food. We pull out food and we throw it away every single day. Every one of us pulls weeds out of our yard. And I hope that this sparks your interest, that you start to look at those plants. They are plants. They were put there into the environment to create the harmony and balance that nature creates, that we try to recreate sometimes in our yards. And when we look down, I want you not to see weeds. I want you to see food. I want, to see, I want you to experience those things that nourish your body, that come from the earth, that come from our environment, that are designed to help us survive in this environment. And ultimately, it's medicine. And it's the same medicine that was used for thousands of years for the people who lived here for thousands of years before us. So remember, there's food and medicine that surrounds us. It's in the trees. It's on the ground, and it's under the ground. It's in the water. So look down and, and experience the food and medicine that's at your feet every day. And I thank you all so much for your time. And I will be more than happy to hang out, ask questions. Please, I love questions. I didn't tell you all that beforehand. I love interruptions and questions, actually. I'm so ADD, it's not even funny. Anybody got any questions about the plants? And I will hang out here and talk about any of these other weird things that you see up here. Yes? I have a question. I was told um, that I'm allergic to weeds. Um, these things that it's not kind of great, maybe I shouldn't eat. Uh, you said weeds or wheat? Weed. Weed. Um, just in general, I don't know exactly. You know, there's... Uh, uh, and a lot of grasses, um, people do have allergies to grasses. Um, and so we're just the end of uh, oak pollen season, which many of us suffer from, me included. Um, you know, right now, my avocado trees, it looks like it's raining from my avocado trees. Grasses are in bloom. We have um, a phenomenal plant called ambrosia here, also known as ragweed. Um, that seems to always be in bloom, sometimes worse than others. So those are very distinct plants that do, that we, we end up with uh, a number of different uh, allergies from those. What gets us with those is their pollen, not the plant itself oftentimes. So yes, be careful with any plant, eat a little bit, rub it on your skin, see how you respond. But the secret to success with eating some of these weeds is um, don't, don't get them when they're in bloom. Get them before they're in bloom. And, and I'll, uh, for those of you who can identify uh, ambrosia, and I love that name, you know, what, what an awesome Latin name to have. Um, ragweed, the cure is in the plant itself. It's the ragweed pollen that drives us all insane, right? Actually, Seven Song, who's a, an herbalist from up in New York, actually comes down to Florida periodically. Um, he actually makes tea out of the plant before it goes to bloom from the leaves, and he uses that for ragweed pollen to counteract the, the rhinitis, sinusitis that people get from that. So make sure you're getting them before they go into to flower and you should be fine with that. Make sure you rinse the plants off because a lot of them will have pollen on it from the oak trees and things like that. Start small, see how you respond, pay attention to your body, that's, that's always the safest. And you had a question, I'll come back over here. Yeah. Oh, as far as how we've yeah. completely jacked up the trees in the environment? Yeah. <laughs> um, needless to say, I'm not a fan. Um, you know, there's, there's an idea in herbal medicine that what... You understand the situation, It is challenging. And, and as we, I mean, forget even the, 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 the larger picture of that. You know, if we see exotics start to come in, kudzu. Uh, you know, daughter seed is the new invasive that I've actually, about eight years ago I saw for the first time in Florida, uh, is actually banned by the USDA, but it's going to be the next kudzu as well as any number of other plants that are invasive. 
And, and so there are many issues that affect our environment, both from the, the genetically modified creepy stuff to, to other things. And as we screw with our environment, everything from the draining of the Everglades and then the restoration of the Everglades, because either way we, we, we piss off the environment. Um, we can also argue that nature will shake us off like a bad case of fleas the way it does everything else, but uh, at some point. Um, and we can start to eat that. You know, it's funny, kudzu is a great example. It's actually in Florida now. It, it's into North Florida. I actually, kudzu is one of the most phenomenal medicines and foods there is. You know, I have to send to China to get it. That's insane. <laughs> it's high in iron. It tastes like a, okay, it doesn't quite taste like a potato chip, but it actually makes a good potato chip. It's for stress affecting your neck and shoulders because we all walk around like this because we're all stressed out from a crappy environment, right? <laughs> and the flowers are for alcohol poisoning. They help with alcohol addiction. Um, and I have to send to China. How insane is that? Which is also probably how the damn thing got here in the first place. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, there are things that as our environment gets screwed up, if we gently adjust it That's or we harvest it. Up. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is putting that horrible mess we created back in balance. Right. And that's what I'm saying. We can I mean, utilize that is the medicine. We can utilize those things if we create the market for it um, and make changes so that we can go, oh, wait a second, I can eat that or that I could sell that to the crazy Chinese herbalist fresh. Yeah. What a what, soup thickener. Add it into your soups. Anybody anemic in here? Great. Eat more kudzu. <laughs> Phenomenal. And it's yummy. Such a deal. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things. There's things that we can influence uh, on the ground at home um, by choosing those plants, creating the environment, recognizing that herbal medicine, there's a tradition that says that everything you need to cure whatever disease affects you grows within five miles. And that's the, it was generally thought of, that was the distance an herbalist could walk in one day, harvest medicine, bring it back for their patient. And so the problem is we forgot that medicine. You know, I try to learn a little bit, and this is scratching the surface. David Winston, uh, Cherokee Medicine, 800 herbs he has control of that he knows and knows how to combine. I wish I could say, I may have an 800 herbs at my clinic. I still look them up. <laughs> so um, some of them I know. So as we start to know our environment, as we start to protect our environment, and then honestly, when, you know, getting into the political realm, you know, protect your environment with your vote. Um, that is a wonderful way to do it. Yes, sir. Somewhat unique, the very first question was on weed. Yes. By the end of this legislation session. Yes. It's going to be legal. And I'm going to say, <laughs> so you guys have heard this, you've heard me say this 10 times already tonight, and it's a Chinese herb. So we actually, we call it homaren, which is the marijuana seeds, and um, we actually use it for constipation. And, and I, I will give you my own personal opinion on that. A, I was a, a big supporter of it, and I won't go into the longer story of that, but I actually, to help somebody who had cancer, my mother, um, I actually had to make a decision of risking my medical license, and as an acupuncturist, I have a medical license, to go and score some weed, make some brownies, and smuggle it into a hospital. And I won't tell you whether I did that or not, um, but how pathetic that in order to improve appetite and help with nausea and vomiting and things like that, that I had to make that ethical decision uh, at that time. So I am a huge supporter of, of that and was actually uh, used my clinic as a place to collect the petitions and so forth. But I will also say that smoking things is bad for you, in case you didn't know that, and that would include marijuana. Um, so I'm really hoping that a lot of food products and, and edible aspects of it, because it is a phenomenal medicine that has been used uh, cross-culturally. And, and I would say cross-culturally is really important when we look at food and medicine. When you see an herb that developed thousands of years ago on separate continents for a similar use, you ought to pay attention. And there are many, many herbs like that that we see on every single traditional people. They use mustard for cough, internally and externally. Maybe there's something to that junk, right? And the same thing, marijuana, in China, here, the Native American people, I don't know about Europe, but maybe, um, have used that as medicine for a long time, and also to get high, but yeah. <laughs> Yes. And I take a shot. Every time I take a shot, an injection. Yeah. My diabetes is my numbers go up. Interesting. And one of the things I use to counteract that is dandelion root. Yes. Phenomenal medicine. And one hell of a weed that everybody hates, especially if you lived up north, you hated dandelion. Right? Absolutely amazing. There are so many uses for dandelion to include food. 
talked about this other new invasive one that you start to see. Ah, uh, daughter seed, yes. What is it? Daughter seed. Okay, so what are the benefits of that? Uh, the Chinese name is tu su zi. <laughs> Say that three times fast. <laughs> Um, actually, it is, uh, actually I taught that to my herb students this weekend. Um, it is actually considered a kidney tonic, not your real kidney, but the cool Chinese energetic idea of a kidney. And it's actually considered a yang tonic. Dudes, it's an aphrodisiac. Um, it's almost steroidal like in its action, but it's also very specific. And somebody was asking me about that earlier and I didn't even think about it until this second. Um, leaking of urine. So frequent urination due to aging. Why would that, that, what's going on here with people? I'm still sending that one to China too. I have to get it from China. They, well, what I mean is yeah. we have so much, you know, depends issues here. So of course that weed would be here. Yeah, I wouldn't want to harvest that. Things. Yeah, I know. No, and, no, no, so that would be awesome. That's the best. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, and it, I mean, sadly, I have to send to China. It has to go through a special facility to put it in tea bags so that we don't accidentally spill a seed out because well, it's already invasive throughout the U.S. because birds love the seeds and they eat it and they poop it out and it spreads the thing just like it does any other plant in the world. But you can't get it? You can't get it? I, there's not enough yet for me to harvest here in Florida. Um, but, yeah, there, there will be. Give it another couple of years. I've seen it out on the beaches, Indian Rocks Beach. I was out giving a lecture and I was looking around. I was like, oh, my God, that's daughter seed. Um, and I was just out at Boyd Hill. I think I saw some out in Boyd Hill. Right by the senior center. Yeah, right? We just plant some, right? I mean, ultimately, isn't that the way we ought to be doing it, that we plant that medicine? Shouldn't every elementary school be growing some of the Spanish needles so that every kid, tell me a, a, an elementary school kid doesn't have a chronic cough and snot pouring out of his nose, right? I mean, that's the nature of elementary school and younger kids. And yet we don't. Yet we don't. We don't have that dried little flower box in front of every house, do we? We manicure our lawns. We pull out our weeds, and we keep our wonderful St. Augustine grass. It's so itchy. I'm a weirdo. Nice. <laughs> of course, you got the Taoist Tai Chi Society thing on. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it's there, and some of, some of them are pretty hibiscus. Yeah, hibiscus. It is an ornamental. It's food and medicine. So we can do pretty. And we can fit and conform somewhat to society's norms and still have medicine in our yard. So, and food, you know? Keep a little plot of Bidens, always. You know? Don't leave home without it. Let's do one more question. All right, anybody else? Daughter of yeah, yeah. Um. I don't have a single book. Honestly, I source a lot of different sources. I, I have to admit, uh, Green Dean, eattheweeds.com, and, and I don't get a, any proceeds from that, is one of my favorites. Um, his is focused on food, and so there's probably two people in the air, in just the Florida area. Andy Ferk uh, is way south, uh, but he does travel around, and Green Dean are the two people who probably do the most talking. Um, the, both of them utilize a lot of food. Andy talks a little bit more about medicine, but he's not an herbalist. And so I'm not a botanist, and those guys are both great botanists. Um, and so, but I actually have used most of these clinically uh, multiple times. And so I've got the practical experience that a lot of them don't. So there's not a single book that I like. Um, I actually have a stack of books that I do try to do botany from. I love the internet, I hate to say it. Um, this is kind of a hearty, you know, a hefty investment. This is more ethnobotanical, so it may not specifically answer questions about that. Uh, and I'll leave these up here if anybody wants uh, to paw through them. This is new. I, I got like the first edition out. Uh, th this is from a couple of anthropologists. Bush medicine is the Bahamas. And so a lot of those plants, of course, uh, are here as well. And we can look Central and South America. Those plants are all through here in our, our Florida environments. So I thank you all. I'm going to hang out. Um, I got paraphernalia up here for Herb Day, which you all should come to. It's fun. It's free. There's Kava Kava. Um, and lectures like this going on all day long from uh, herbalists throughout our community and lots of other cool stuff. So thank you all so much for your attention. I so appreciate it.